Have you ever thought why combat aircraft fly like this, with two ship or four ship formations, often quite close to each other? Or did you ever think where the term wingman comes from? Well, there are obviously good reasons why things are like they are and they're all rooted in the history of air combat tactics. But the fifth generation air warfare is uprooting all of them. Let's begin. Yes, sir. Let's begin. Fifth generation air warfare. It's a mouthful, but it is a well-developed and continuously evolving doctrine and you likely never heard about it. I want to underline that this type of thinking is happening worldwide in all major air forces, but here we are referring mostly to the American thinking just because it started earlier and it is more developed. Russian and Chinese do have their equivalents, but there are differences and we will discuss them another time. There are four elements in the fifth generation warfare the network, the combat cloud, and the multi-domain construct. Sir, you are forgetting my specialty, the information fusion construct. Uh, yes, Otis, I was going to mention it, okay? Because AIS like mine are the key technology to enable the fusion. Otis, why don't you found the union? How does it sound? The network name derives from the consideration that military forces are systems of systems. That is, their combination is different and hopefully more effective than the sum of isolated systems. The network behavior and capability cannot be described by simply adding its parts. To make a stupid example, the capability of damaging the opponent of a carrier group is not just the sum of the number of cannons times the caliber times the rate of fire times the available rounds. It is not like this because a single precision strike on a common center by one of the aircraft has a disproportionate effect in respect to the number of weapons used. The network is composed by four layers, information, sensing, effectors and command. The information layer is the complex of means that transport information to and from the network nodes. It may be wired, uh, wireless or space-based, and the nodes are the sources and the receivers of the information, but also the consumers of it. The payload of the communication layer has never been more diverse than today. Not only there are the classic text and voice communications, but today we have all sorts of digital payloads, like high-definition pictures, videos, and machine-readable data. In the context of machine-to-machine -machine communication, the information layer, which is sometimes referred to as a grid, you find this term in literature as well, may include military and civilian infrastructures, and geographically it may extend from the theater of operations back to nodes anywhere in the world. For example, the F-35 just-in-time parts network communications may extend from an austere base in the jungle back to the continental United States. Uh, you may have heard the term network-centric warfare. It is an idea from the 90s, but it is the foundation of what we are talking about now. Further down, we have the sensing layer. The sensor layer is composed by all the sensors that can generate the information that is distributed and shared through the information layer. Traditionally, radars have a major role in the conduct of air operations, but the network layer allows for very structured payloads from highly sophisticated sensor systems like, once again, those on board of the F-35. These are actually a mix of electromagnetic, optical and computing-derived information. In air warfare, since most of the sensors are airborne, their density and position might vary widely and quickly, but generally we consider theater-level layers. One level down, we have the effectors layer. Effector is basically modern, politically correct, for weapon. Strictly speaking, a kinetic effector is a weapon in the classic sense, like a gun or a missile. However, non-kinetic effectors do exist, like, for example, electronic warfare. And in this layer, we find all the things we usually focus on, the aircraft and other assets capable of, uh, well, 
going boom. Obviously, the same aircraft can be a communication node, a sensor, and an effector node all at the same time. The deepest layer on the network is the command grid. Its components are the human decision makers, but also knowledge base and AI systems that support the command function. This is the layer that controls the others and manages the battle. The command elements go through the so-called ODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, to define what needs to be done. So what is the purpose of having all this structure? The main purpose of the network, its main advantage, is providing all the actors involved with the information and the assets necessary to go very quickly through the ODA loop and keep the initiative while maintaining the opponent out of balance. As you can see, the network is built to support fast-paced and complex operation. It is an offensive and a defensive construction at the same time. It is designed for planning and replanning according to necessity, and it relies mostly on the use of long-range weapons, thus achieving tactical surprise by means of using unexpected effectors from unexpected directions. Uh, now, if you think that all of this doesn't resemble at all the popular concept of combat operations, you're right, but wait to hear this. So, we have seen that all the systems are arranged in a network. Together with the network, there is the concept of combat cloud. Like cloud computing, but with weapons. Uh, yes, Otis, that's the origin of the name, but I personally don't think it is really appropriate. The Combat Cloud is an operational concept. The idea is that whatever capability you need to engage a target, you may download that from the Combat Cloud as needed. The Cloud is the combination of all the elements connected in the network that can be used as seen fit by the commanders. Just to make an example, an air defense commander may have the intelligence from an AWACS, the target identification from a fighter, the targeting from a ground-based radar, the effector, for example a missile, from a different fighter, and the guidance from a drone. So basically, a commander goes shopping for capabilities rather than assigning a mission to a group of assets. Pretty ambitious, but not impossible. There are various advantages with this approach. No aircraft or sensor should be critical for success. That is, the cloud is resilient if it works. But also, the use of the single specific asset is optimized and every asset has, in principle, a picture of the global situation. Which is definitely useful to do the right thing if the orders don't make sense. So far, we have talked about air warfare, but this approach is not necessarily limited to it. Multi-domain operations involve air, sea, land, but also cyber and space. There is no reason why a ship or a ground-based defense system shouldn't be a node in the network. And actually, ground-based air defenses are definitely better being integrated in the network. Friendly fire, anyone? If these assets are integrated in the network, then it becomes possible to further optimize their use. For example, long-range ground-based guided missiles may be used to engage the opponent's air defenses to open up a gap where the aircraft can penetrate. The US Navy has recently been toying with the concept of distributed lethality. This is expected to be an alternative to relying on airborne platform for practically everything like they do now. In practice, it means adding long-range shooters or drone capabilities to ships with other missions like transports, uh, logistic ships, or landing ships. And please notice that this is a concept that could make the littoral combat ship useful for something. Again, it is a way to keep your opponent imbalanced. It is a way to speed up the act part of the ODA loop to execute that part faster than your opponent. 
Synergy is dominant here. The approach to the operation is not a service-centric approach, but a joint domain-centric approach. The United States Air Force and the US Navy both have capable air forces and the US Army has flying assets as well, but they all coordinate and operate together in the air domain, being supported or supporting assets and operations in different domains. The other element is that through the multi-domain synergy, it is not necessary to dominate in all domains to achieve the desired end state. This approach allows for the creation and the exploitation of the windows of opportunity to hit the opponent's centers of gravity and gaining the operational advantage. Fusion warfare refers to the capability of extracting a single coherent picture from several different data points and data sources. Otis is correct. It is intuitive how all the elements that we have described so far do a large amount of data that can't really be processed manually by humans. Some form of automated processing that turns the isolated piece of information into a single picture is necessary. Are you saying that we are indispensable? I sir? apologize, my dear viewer, but Otis sometimes displays very human traits. One is attention seeking and thirst of validation. You may belittle our contribution, but the fact remains you couldn't do sensor fusion without us. Well, Otis, fusion warfare and sensor fusion are two different things. Okay, sensor fusion is an oldish discipline. It is used in civilian activities too, and it existed even before digital electronics in some basic forms. Fusion warfare doesn't fuse only sensors, but every type of intelligence available, including human intelligence. Obviously, in this day and age, everything is digital, but the origin of the information is mostly sensors, but could be anything. And the fact that everything is digital means that formats and protocols are often incompatible. So, translator nodes are necessary, and today it is an area where Western Air Forces are investing a lot. The fusion capability produces two different classes of deliverables human readable situation reports and maps, and machine usable targeting data. There is also a lot of other stuff, but these are the most important ones. Obviously, the former goes to the commanders, while the latter can be distributed and can be used by elements of the network for further analysis or to physically attack the targets. All this complex arrangement is expected to provide information superiority throughout the network and, as we said, support quick and effective order loops that disrupt the equivalent opponent's loops. Anyway, all of this begs two questions. The first is, how much of this is ready and usable? And the answer is pretty simple, and it is, well, a fair bit. But Western forces are still in a transitional state. This is a change that is happening quietly in the background, is hardly talked about, but it is fundamental. It is going to fundamentally alter the way the West goes to war. The heterogeneity of the systems and the protocols in use are an obstacle, obviously, but at the same time, homogeneity means that vulnerability is increased. A single countermeasure against a node class can bring down all the nodes of the same class. So rather than having homogeneity, we may want to have interoperability, which is a different concept, but this is becoming really complex and I will probably get lost in it. So let's go to the second question, which is even more important. How can we be sure that all of this is not just a house of cards ready to come down at the first disturbance? There is no surprise that a system including humans may lead to unexpected results. Thank you. We open with the idea that the fifth generation air warfare is a very complicated way of waging war. Complex systems are inherently more vulnerable in many ways if compared with simpler systems. This is a subject that goes beyond strategy and tactics. It goes beyond warfare and it goes into the system theory. This is a discipline that studies systems as a collection of related and interacting parts. Fifth generation air warfare, but modern warfare in general, is the result of a system of systems whose complexity is 
very, very high, and it is very high even today. So complexity is often the harbinger of unexpected behaviors that may lead to undesired results. Now, I'm pretty sure that some will understand that I'm saying that fifth generation air warfare doesn't work. That's not it. I'm saying that is still unproven and we still don't know what happens when it is attacked in unexpected or creative ways. That's just a reasonable caveat. Okay, good. So, where are we? Well, complexity is an inherent vulnerability in several ways, and we have no proof that in a near-peer conflict, on a large scale, this type of warfare is going to behave as expected. Typically, the flip side of complexity is fragility. If one element of the interactive systems doesn't work properly, the whole complex system is hurt, or at least the effectiveness goes down to where it was with the previous concept. A small damage doesn't necessarily bring a small reduction of effectiveness in this case. The network is built for resilience. It is built with redundancy in mind. It is built to adapt, but the problem still exists because it must work properly to be resilient. We can't stress this enough. If everything is working, it is going to show an incredible effectiveness. We have been seeing this for a few years now in large-scale flag exercises, but if everything is not working as expected, things may go wrong very quickly and in several unexpected ways. Let's make an example. Let's consider the case where it is impossible to update the combat aircraft scenario files and the all the other digital libraries because the lab where they are created back in continental United States or in Europe was, for example, sabotaged. This could be just a small damage of just few buildings somewhere far away from the theater of operations, but it could have a tremendous impact on the operations themselves. Let's make another example. One of the considerations that is often made in this context is that the centralization of command will naturally follow when information is freely available in every point of the network. So, hit the command center where all the decisions are made and most of the expertise that drives the war effort is gone. I'm talking about the people here, the people who have the expertise to run the show. Sure, you can build redundancy and resilience in the network, but definitely it is one thing more to worry about. So, in general, since the purpose of fifth generation warfare is to achieve an effectiveness much higher than the sum of all the parts involved, the elimination of one part might have a disproportionately high effect on the system as a whole. Mind, this is not a new problem and it is normally considered by modern warfare planners. Every force has centers of gravity that, if attacked and eliminated, can cause more damage than the actual loss. Within the fifth generation air warfare, this aspect is more prominent than ever. The whole purpose of this construction is to be effective in attacking this center of gravities, but what happens if the opponent attacks your center of gravity? At a more down-to-heart level, the fifth generation aircraft is designed to be part of this large team of fifth gen, fourth gen, and support aircraft, all backed by a large intelligence, command and control, and logistic tail. If this structure is not available for any reason, then the effectiveness is also greatly reduced. The US, in general, is capable of filtering it at at least at the beginning of a near-peer conflict, but how many of other allies could autonomously do that? And, and by the way, this is the major criticism of the F-35, is not all the other stuff that you hear around. The aircraft is an excellent aircraft. There is a lot of unjustified slander, but it is an aircraft built to fight within a United States-led coalition. What if a country decides to leave NATO or it is going to use the aircraft against another NATO country? It seems far-fetched, but it is really not. Uh, I'm not going down this rabbit hole because it goes into geopolitics, but it is something to keep in mind. And you also have to keep in mind that in this picture there is another element that is missing. Tactics and the people that are going to execute them. Because fifth-generation tactics are nothing like what you have seen so far. But this is going to be the subject of the next video in this series. 
So thank you very much for watching the video this far. Thank you very much for giving me your time. I consider this a honor. And if you have enjoyed it, please do the usual YouTube stuff. Uh, subscribe if you haven't yet. Like or dislike and hit the bell to be notified when anything new comes out. A big thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member. You are absolute stars, you are fundamental for this operation. And in case you wanted to join their ranks, you will have access to, well, me, but also scripts, part of videos that are not going to go live, other material that I prepare for the videos uh, that are normally not available uh, and they will never be available on the main channel. So, thank you very much for watching again. Stay tuned for the next episode and see you next time.